So good afternoon. We are not going to start right yet. It's not quite two o'clock, but if you're dialing into the webinar on myths of traffic calming and complete streets, you're in the right place. We'll start right up at uh, just after 2 p.m. in about a minute, minute and a half. I need some theme music. Next time I promise I'll, I'll come up with a way to do some theme music. Just have to come up with the right song. So good afternoon and uh, welcome to a webinar on the myths of traffic calming and complete streets. My name is David Orr. I'm the director here at the Cornell Local Roads Program, the New York State LTAP Center. And we wanna welcome you to another one of our Spring 2020 webinars, okay? So hopefully we'll have a good time and a good day and uh, you'll get something out of it, okay? Now I'm just gonna hide my video to save a little screen space. Uh, you're welcome to uh, remember what I look like and uh, we'll go from there, okay? So the myths of traffic calming complete streets. Before we get going, I got, got a couple of polls we're gonna be doing. so. Uh, I can even launch it here. Let's hit the button. Okay, so just uh, three questions for you. How many folks are at your site? Scroll down and who do you work for? And then finally keep scrolling to how long have you been at your job? And you need to answer all three questions uh, so we can get the results when you hit the uh, submit button. Okay. And we'll try to get about 80% uh, of you to vote in. That would be great. Getting close. Okay, we're in the polling and we'll share the results. So most of you, as has been happening, uh, most of you are by yourself. There's a few of you, however, who have five or more, hopefully about uh, two meters apart. Most of you work for local governments, but obviously we have some state consultants. And 5% uh, of you are honest. You, know, you work for the weekend, though I have to admit I, uh, my weekends are disappearing. Trying to keep them straight. How long have you been at your job? A lot of you for more than 10 years, uh, but some of you are brand new and there should be something in here for everybody, but that helps me quite a bit as I'm going through the slide deck. Okay. Get that out of the way. Now a couple of uh, things to help you out if you haven't uh, Uh, been on one of these before. If you scroll, bring your mouse down to the bottom, you'll see a couple of settings. You've got a chat pod, which has been disabled. We don't have chat, but you can raise your hand if you've got an issue. And we're actually going to be using that feature later on. Okay. We're going to be using the raise your hand feature. So if you could do me a favor, drag down and go find the raise your hand feature and see if you can find that for me. So see if you can raise your hand. Cool, most of it looks like you found it. We're gonna be using that later on. We talk about the myths themselves, so. Okay, so uh, Amanda, you can go ahead and lower everybody's hands and we'll keep going. Uh, this class is worth professional development hours here in New York State. It's worth one PDH. Uh, only the one person registered, for those of you who have multiple people that a site is gonna be able to Get that and you have to stay for at least 90% of the session in order to earn the PDH. Uh, it is considered a course under the rules we have here in New York State, just for those who care. And what'll happen is we're gonna be sending you a certificate if you're here for at least two thirds or so of the webinar itself. Everybody that participates gets a certificate. You'll get a PDH if you send us a copy of the certificate of attendance that we'll be sending to you within a day or two after the webinar. Uh, if you are in another state, uh, you will need to contact your LTAP center and uh, see what the rules are in that particular state. 
Now, if you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can still register. You just need to go to uh, Zoom, go and uh, register via Zoom to be able to allow us to give you credit for that if that's something you're interested in. Okay, so our next poll, uh, just help me out here. Okay, let me go find the next poll and I'm gonna launch it. Which of the following have I done in my community? And you should be able to select, I'm hoping multiple answers here, and it's what it says. Speed humps, roundabouts, mini roundabouts, these are the little, uh, don't really change the geometry of the actual intersection, mid-block crossings, bike lanes, bike and pedestrian trails, or road closures in neighborhoods. So which of these have you done? And this one I know will take a little bit longer for you to vote because you're gonna be selecting it says here, not allowing multiple answers. Hmm, well, then if uh, it doesn't do multiple answers, at least click on one you've put into your neighborhood. That'll still help me quite a bit. Okay. And if you haven't, you haven't, that's okay. It's not a, it's not a big deal. Okay, so we're gonna end the polling and I'll share the results with you. So again, a lot of you have uh, selected roundabouts. We've got bike lanes, mid-block crossings, mini roundabouts, speed ups, everything is in the list. And all of these items can be part of a traffic calming program or a complete streets program. But there are some things about traffic calming and complete streets that people don't uh, quite always get correct. And that's my goal today, is to help you make sure you understand what complete streets and traffic calming are and what they are not. Okay, so now I get this out of the way and we'll get going here. So why do we want to do complete streets and traffic calming? What is the reason that these have become popular tools? Well, part of the reason they're popular tools is we are trying to improve our community. Community is key in the case of both traffic calming and complete streets. Okay, so it's something to be very well. Okay, and it's pretty interesting to see Complete streets, part of the reason for complete streets has to do, well, with our health. It actually can improve our health if we do it properly. In 1991, this is data from a national study looking at obesity trends in the United States. And in 1991, as you can see, obesity rates were pretty low. Very few states were above 15% in terms of adults who were obese. But 10 years later, by 2001, it had begun to grow even more. And by the time we got to 2016, as you can see, once my computer catches up, obesity rates were pretty high all over. And uh, well, that's not good. And one of the things about a good complete streets program, it actually gets us out, can actually help in this particular case. That's one reason, it's not the only reason complete streets are out there, but it is something you might wanna think about. How do we get people active? How do we keep them moving, okay? The other thing that complete streets and traffic calming can help with, and they don't always help with, as we'll talk about in the myth section, they can help with speed. Speed is an issue that tends to drive a lot of the things we do in the public sector. And of course, everybody's just saying, ah, cars travel too fast, okay? So just something to keep in mind. And wow, I gotta do something about that. So people are always concerned about speed, but the reality is if somebody could put a driveway on an interstate, they would. And then the next day they'd call up and complain because people were speeding in front of their house. So it's a balancing act. So before we get into too much, I'm gonna come back to my cars. I wanna launch one more poll question for you. Uh, let me find it here. And we'll go with this one. And I'm gonna launch the poll. And I just want you to, Tell me what you think. I'm gonna list four things complete streets and traffic calming might do, but one of them isn't really completely true. So complete streets includes all the following except streets are not just for cars, quality not quantity, may require mixed functional classifications or avoid mixed functional classifications, and the same answers for traffic calming. Okay, so go ahead and vote. And again, I just wanna know what you're thinking right now, see how you vote.
Okay. We'll see if we can get up to at least 75% this time. And again, remember, it's all anonymous. We don't care how you answer more than anything else. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to end the polling. I'm going to share the results with you. Okay, but I'm not going to tell you the answer right now. I'm going to tell you the answer in a couple of seconds. Okay, so most of you voted for avoid mixed classification for both complete streets and traffic calming, but I'll come back to the answer here in just a minute. Okay. Okay, one of the other things we're trying to do, remember we said speed is an issue. So this is something I do want to keep in the back of your mind as we're going through all of this. Part of the reason speed is so critical, especially in urban communities, is humans, okay? So imagine vehicle coming along a car, hitting somebody at 40, 30, or 20 miles an hour. Three things can happen. They can pretty much walk away, they could be injured, or they could be severely hurt or killed, okay? So let's look at the possibilities. At 20 miles an hour, most people actually are able to walk away with maybe a scrape, but nothing super serious. But 10% or so are still killed and you know, almost 30, 40% are severely injured. Just increased to 30 miles an hour, which is the most common urban speed here in New York State. And now almost half the people are killed almost half the people are injured severely and only about a little over 10%, 12, 13% are able to walk away with just a scrape. And of course, once you get to 40 miles an hour, it really gets severe. Now we're talking 70, 80% of the people involved in those kind of collisions that aren't in the vehicle, a pedestrian are killed. And that's assuming an adult with kids and a seniors, it can be even a higher percentage. So part of the reason we're looking at these things that hopefully can slow down and reduce the chances of these collisions occurring. And when they do occur, they occur at slow speeds, okay? So what is a complete street? Well, complete streets are only for pedestrians. That's what we hear all the time. Ah, streets are only for pedestrians. So we're gonna do a complete streets. No, not really. We're gonna slow down everyone but me. That happens a lot. Oh, we're gonna do this because we want to slow everybody else down, but I can keep going. That's not really complete streets. How about uh, once my mouse decides to wake up here? Why are there so many cars? And let's get that DPW to keep everyone else out of our neighborhood. How many times do you hear that? Where somebody says the people are speeding through our neighborhood. Okay. That's not really a complete street. A complete street serves everybody. The Institute for Transportation Engineers defines a complete street as complete streets are designed and operated to enable safe access for all users. Pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, and bus riders of all ages and abilities are able to safely move along and across a complete street. Now I have my own definition that I actually use for complete streets and traffic calming that I'll give you at the very end of the presentation, but that's a pretty good definition. If can be a bit unwieldy at times. Traffic calming, what we hear with traffic calming is the other side of that coin, okay? We hear things like, oh, you gonna wake up for me? No, that's not traffic calming. Herdy cats to a solution or slowing cars down sounds a lot like complete streets. Getting cars out of my neighborhood or getting that highway department to understand my problem. Well, again, that's not really what traffic calming is about, okay? Again, the Institute for Transportation Engineers says traffic calming is a combination of mainly physical measures that reduce the negative effects of motor vehicle use, alter driver behavior, and improve conditions for non-motorized street users, okay? Now, those subtle differences mean that complete streets and traffic calming are similar, but have one major difference between them. For complete streets, we've already seen, streets are not just for cars. We've got to worry about the pedestrians, the bicyclists, but we also have to worry about buses and trucks, okay? In traffic calming, we've got the same thing, okay? Complete streets, quality, not quantity. That's one of the key. 
the quality of the community, the quality of the road within that community is very important. And the same is true in traffic calming. But in complete streets, we know that there are mixed functional classifications, roads that are both arterials, collectors, local, sometimes completely mixed, okay? But traffic calming works best when we try to avoid those mixed functional classifications, which means sometimes it can be very hard to apply principles of both. So keep that in mind as we're going through it. Complete streets actually says sometimes we get mixed classifications, traffic calming says we don't. And as a reminder for those who don't remember, arterials are the main roads, interstates, the roads connect major cities, collectors, these are the secondary ones that get us from point A to point B off the local system. And the local system is where we all live or go to work and school when we're able to. So here's a community that's just north of the Cornell campus. And I'll highlight the roads for you in yellow. There's lots of houses, as you can see in the uh, old infrared picture that shows. This is a challenging place to try to do any kind of either complete streets or traffic calming. And they have speed humps through this community. But the challenge is this community serves as a place for people to live, but at the same time, it also serves as a collector to bring traffic to the university when the traffic is coming to the university. So it can be very hard to implement traffic calming, but complete streets, there may be some things we can do, okay? So keep these things in mind. Uh, they're pretty important to keep in mind, but remember their world is filled with preconceived notions, okay? So I wanna go through a few of those before I get to the myth. And we'll put in a quote here by my friend, uh, Mr. Barra. You may have heard of him. When you come to a fork in the road, take it, okay? So I want you to choose a sandwich. We're not gonna do a poll, this is just a mental exercise. Choose a sandwich. Do you want a sandwich with 59 carbs, 33 carbs, or five carbs? And if you're on the Atkins diet, you're gonna choose the one with five carbs. So let's go pick out the sandwiches that are do that. This is the uh, Subway Chicken Teriyaki, half size, six inch. Uh, here's the Wendy's Junior Bacon Cheeseburger with no mayonnaise. And then finally, the Monster Burger from Hardee's, if you remove the buns, five carbs, okay? Now, if you're doing a low carb diet, that's a great solution. But if you're looking at calories, maybe the top two were a good solution. And if you're looking at fat, well, the Monster Burger might not be your best choice. Five grams, 18 grams, and 104 grams of fat, okay? So depending on what you're looking for, you might get different things. And that's true with a lot of these things we use for traffic calming in complete streets is they have different negatives and positives depending on who you're serving. So keep that in mind. Remember, perception is reality, okay? You know, which way is up depends on your point of view. Whether this is calming traffic or making people angry is your point of view, okay? So how many black dots? Your eye can be fooled and we can get pre preconceived notions, okay? There are no black dots. It's just the way light works when our brains see certain situations, okay? So a couple of preconceived notions that I wanna break down now. I don't even wanna worry about them when it comes to the myths of involving traffic calming in complete streets, just to realize that a lot of people fight these things because they have notions which are not really true. Like nobody walks here anymore. There's probably a lot more people walking even before the current conditions, but there were probably a lot more people walking than you think. You just might not have seen them. And remember, traffic calming in complete streets will not change the belief of people that nobody walks. So you have to do some investigation to make sure people understand there are people walking. There are other vehicles you got to worry about than just the car. You got to worry about the trucks and the buses and things like that. Perception is reality, but traffic calming in complete streets is not a panacea, okay? You can try some of these tools that are in the toolkit, but they're not gonna solve all of the problems. You might actually move the problem from one road to another, okay? You might put in a diverter in one place and move somebody to another street and actually make the problem worse, okay? In this case, they put a diverter in to try to keep people from going through a particular area, 
The people on that street were happy. The people on the parallel streets were very unhappy. Okay. And we have met the enemy and they are us. If you put them in incorrectly, you can actually make the problems worse and decrease safety and actually increase the chances of a collision or a crash. Okay. So you've got to install these things properly, understanding all the tools in the toolkit. Because if you're not careful, traffic calming and complete streets can actually make things worse. Now, the four E's. Before I tell you the four E's, uh, we'll do a poll here just to see if anybody can remember what are the four E's. These are the four road safety E's, not the uh, drainage four E's or the four tops. These are the four E's. What are the which one of these five is not a road safety 4E? Education, environment, enforcement, engineering, or emergency response. This is for road safety, remember. And we'll wait till we get 80% of you. Okay, so we're in the polling, share the results. Okay, so the two leading candidates were emergency response and environment. Okay, now I've seen six or seven E's in almost every field of engineering, but we traditionally have sort of said over time for road safety, there are really four major E's that we deal with. Okay, education, everybody, we're trying to educate like we're doing today. Engineering, and there's a lot of things that are engineering that people don't always agree are engineering. Enforcement, certainly when it comes to road safety and traffic, we have to have some enforcement. And turns out emergency response is one of the four E's for road safety. How quickly can you get somebody if a crash does occur? Can you get them to the hospital? Can you get them emergency care? Now, I'm not saying environment isn't important. It is. But from a road safety standpoint, Environment is sort of in the second tier. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's a lower priority. It's just this is a road safety question for the four E's. And as I say, I've seen six or seven E's out there. Enhancement, uh, pick an E word, you probably can find it in a list somewhere. To do this, we really need to help identify and describe the problem. We really have to start there more than anything else. In this case, we're trying to get the critters across the road. Make sure you understand the problem before you apply a solution. Okay, so to identify the problem, go out and look, evaluate the alternatives that you might use, respond to what the solution might be, take action or not. A lot of times we do nothing and that is still a decision. The idea that doing nothing isn't a decision. No, it's always a decision. Okay, the null alternative as we were taught in engineering school. And then after it's been in place for a while, reevaluate. You put a new traffic light up, check the timing after three or four months. Is it really working? Are our signals properly timed? Are there odd changes that we've created by putting in the new traffic signal that we didn't account for? You put in a roundabout or a mid block crossing or a speed hump. Is it really doing what you thought it was going to be doing? Did it actually make the problem better or did it make it worse? And it's a circle. You're gonna to have to keep coming back to it and improving over time, okay? But keep that in mind as we go forward. The single most important tool by far is communication, okay? Absolutely the single most important thing that we can deal with, okay? And if you don't have good communication, it doesn't matter. And remember, most communication is not verbal. It's how we stand, how we feel, and how we write, okay? So keep that in mind. You've got to communicate. Now, this is not a webinar on traffic calming measures. I could do a whole hour. Actually, I could do more than an hour. IT has some great materials on what is good traffic calming, and most state DOTs do as well. But I just want you to realize there's a lot more to traffic calming than speed humps and roundabouts. But a lot of people fall in love with those two particular items. All kinds of things are part of traffic calming and complete streets. There's a full menu of options, and make sure you look at everything in the toolkit. Okay, so for instance, 
here's traffic calming by somebody who didn't even realize they were doing traffic calming. This is a campus of one of the state universities here in New York. And they've got on-street parking. And that actually is a form of traffic calming because people coming in and out, you have to be watching for them. It slows people down. It gives the pedestrians a little bit of safety. Um, there are some communities that still have on-street parking. Not many, but there are a few. They didn't design it as traffic calming or complete streets, but it serves that role. But again, it became almost an, or an organic kind of device in this particular case. So keep that in mind as we talk about the myths. Looking at the problem, make sure you don't just look at an isolated spot. Look at the whole community. Doing a small fix in one place can be an issue for you. And make sure you look at everything. It's hard to see it in the distance here, but there's actually a bit of a bump down the road there. But look at how people drive, okay? Sit out there and watch. This is the one case where you might want to purposely not have on that safety vest. Stand off out of the way, don't get in the road, and watch carefully because people drive differently when you watch them with your safety vest on. Now there's some realities that we have to deal with. You've got to have community involvement. That's going to be key. It won't succeed without it. You've got to examine all the alternatives available. Again, from doing nothing up to total reconstruction of an area if need be. And the best traffic calming is self-enforcing. And that's one of the keys. If you've got good traffic calming and good complete streets, they're self-enforcing. You don't need people up there enforcing the speed. You don't need people up there enforcing a diversion. They do that themselves, okay? And one of the things I've heard people say as well, this isn't engineering, this is just uh, some kind of art. No, it is engineering. Both traffic calming and complete streets are engineering. There's good information out there about how to use and apply them. So remember that, okay? So what I wanna do now is I wanna go through the myths. And we'll go through the myths. And as I do this, I'm gonna show you a myth and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand to see if you believe the myth. Again, this is totally anonymous. I don't care, I just want you to see what you think. Not all of these myths are untrue, purposely so. So just to keep that in mind. Okay, and remember, raise your hand by dragging down and finding the raise hand feature near the bottom. Okay. So for complete streets and traffic calming, I should focus on solving problems at a spot, like for instance, congestion at a particular location. Is that a good use of complete streets and traffic calming? Again, raise your hand if you think that's true. And yes, I do agree that Santa is not a myth, he is real. I read that uh, many a time. I, uh, I don't have any problem with that. Now the Easter Bunny, I don't know, but hey, there was some chocolate bunnies, so I, he must be real too. But, okay, so not a lot of you raised your hand, and that's okay, okay? Solving problems at a spot is real tempting with both complete streets and traffic calming, okay? And Amanda, you could go ahead and lower their hands. Uh, the challenge with all of these tools is if you solve the problem in one location, you might actually move it somewhere else. So be very careful with both tools, complete streets and traffic calming, that you look at communities, that you look at neighborhoods, that you look at larger areas, because you can actually move the problem and you make people really happy in one location and really unhappy with another, okay? And by the way, for those who didn't uh, find it, we actually have a handout that'll be available for you. It'll be posted on our website and uh, it will be placed into the chat pod, or actually what we could do is somebody next time they answer a question, I can type it into the uh, question, we could type it into the question and answer it, and you'd actually see the link there. So I just need somebody to type me a question on where is the uh, handout, and we can put a link in for you. What's the link? Very good, thank you. So uh, there we go, we got it. So somebody can type that in for you, and then you can find it. And uh, Adam's gonna answer it for us, and he'll type that in for you, and you can find it pretty easily. Now, the next one, traffic, stop signs slow traffic. I want stop signs at these intersections to slow cars. So would you believe that or not? Raise your hand if you believe that. Now, I know most of us work in the field, so we're not gonna get a lot of hands raised. I don't expect to see too many here, okay? So in just a few minutes, 
we've only got uh, 20 or so hands raised. And that's not surprising. Most of us realize that extra stop signs don't actually slow people down. They actually make things worse because people tend to either roll through the stop sign or worse, they accelerate away from the stop sign even faster, okay? So in this particular case, uh, you might be better off to not have too many stop signs. Extra stop signs don't necessarily do what you think. Stop signs are there for traffic control. They're really not part of a traffic calming or complete streets program, but the public thinks they'll slow people down, but it turns out they don't really slow them down like they think. How about speed limit signs instead? So we'll just put up speed limit signs. That'll slow traffic down. The speed limit sign says 45. I'll make the speed limit lower to make the cars go slower. So uh, Amanda, if you could lower their hands and then let them put them back up for me. Okay, so put your hand back up. And while uh, you're raising your hand on this one, uh, somebody noted that the uh, some sites don't allow downloads. We'll get your uh, emails and afterwards we can email you uh, the location, okay? But for those who can, I'll go ahead and put it in the question and answer if I can get the pasting to work. Uh, and the answer is it's not. So we'll just have to email it to you. I'm not gonna fight with it now, I wanna keep moving on. So it turns out speed limit signs, somewhat like stop signs, don't really cause people to go slower. People drive at a particular speed, and if you artificially lower the speed limit, what actually happens is you get speeding, okay? So don't lower the speed limit extra if you don't have to. Either use your state rules in New York State, most state roads and county roads and town roads are done by the State Department of Transportation. In other states, they use tools like U.S. limits. Uh, again, pick a tool that works well for you and have a consistency to your speed limits. Remember, it's the manual of uniform traffic control devices and a good speed. Um, somebody asked the question on the previous one of the, what are the best studies that show stop signs do not slow traffic down? There's a great study out of Michigan that's available. It's not in the resource list in the handout, but you can find it via ITE. And there's also some very good information on traffic calming available from most state DOTs that talk about that. But there's a good study out of the state of Michigan. And if you need to, I can find you that link. You could always email us afterwards. And my email will be on the last slide. Okay, our next one. We have no pedestrians. Now I said this earlier, but we still hear this particular myth. Uh, how many of you think you don't have pedestrians? Again, Amanda, if you could lower their hands. We have that uh, magic person behind the curtain. So how many of you don't think you have pedestrians? So you don't really need to worry about sidewalks. Almost nobody, because all of us realize there's a lot more pedestrians than we think. They're all over the place. Now, obviously, if we see a goat path like this where the grass has been worn away, we got pretty good evidence that there are pedestrians. But even in rural areas, there are times when there are pedestrians walking. We just may not catch them in a particular time of day. So you need to talk to the community. You need to look around and see. You'd be surprised. I worked over in Yates County, New York, a very rural area, but there's a large Mennonite population and a lot of them will walk along the roadway. So you have to keep those people in mind. Walkers are much more ubiquitous than we might think. And of course, right now, there's all kinds of walkers. So on the other side of the coin, we hear this. There's no place to walk. I would walk if there were sidewalks. How many of you believe this? That people, if you put in a sidewalk, people will walk. I suspect a lot more of you would vote yes on this one. Yeah, and it can help. Okay, this is one of those myths that it can help. It can help on the kinds of roads where walking really isn't safe to do so otherwise, okay? So this is where having a good complete streets and traffic calming program can be very helpful on those roads that are collectors and are arterials where there's really not a good place to walk otherwise. But in a local community, like I live in a tight little cul-de-sac type area, not quite, but it's close to it. Having sidewalks or not doesn't change how people walk. You should be going slow in that neighborhood anyway. 
and a good traffic calming and complete streets program might actually not include sidewalks in certain places where people walk on the street and the pedestrians have the priority for the right of way. But yes, it can be helpful on a major road, okay? But some people will walk anyway, but we wanna to try to think about how can we do that safely, okay? Okay, we can lower their hands and see about this one. It's the out-of-towners who speed through my neighborhood. We don't speed here, others speed. How many of you believe that one? Yeah, I see, almost nobody. How many of you have heard people say that? That's what I thought, yeah. Most of you have heard that one. That is one of the most common things you hear all the time. Uh, there was a road north of where I live here. It go, goes between the Cornell University campus and the airport. And they lowered the speed limit because everybody was complaining. And it was in a village, so they were allowed to do that. And because we're going to stop all those speeders. <laughs> then they started getting a lot of complaints because they were arresting the people who lived in the community. You're not supposed to arrest us. You're supposed to arrest those out-of-towners. Uh, it is actually a, an interesting challenge because uh, speed, almost everybody speeds some. Now, there's a good question here in the uh, Q&A box. And it says, isn't a complete street a philosophy accommodating all road users while traffic calming is a process to increase livability among the roadway? And I've heard that, and I'm not saying I totally disagree with you. Um, now, it's a little more than a philosophy for complete streets. There, as I said, there is engineering behind it. There is some engineering tools that are available to set up a complete streets to think about all the users, okay? While traffic calming is a process, it's actually a series of tools that can be used to increase livability. But it also increases usability for the non-motorized traffic as well. So it's a little bit of both in both cases, okay? But my biggest concern I see with traffic calming and complete streets is people applying it and not understanding some of the things that it doesn't necessarily do, okay? Okay, you can lower the hands, we'll go to the next one. Traffic volumes can be reduced on demand. All we need to do is reduce the number of cars. So first, how many of you have uh, believed this? Nobody's putting their hand up. How many of you have heard this from the public? Yeah, again, this is one of those classic ones. We pretty much know volumes of traffic, you can't do a lot to stop. People are gonna drive when they need to drive. And they're gonna drive the way they feel is most comfortable, okay? So you can't just reduce the number of cars. Even with the best traffic calming, one of the tools in traffic calming is to move traffic from one place to another. But you're not getting rid of the traffic. It will still be there. What you need to do with good traffic calming is move the traffic to a place that can accommodate that traffic where you don't have the collision problem. Put them back on the collectors and the arterials and away from the local streets. In the case of a complete street, people still need to get to their houses. They still need to get to their homes. So the best you can do there is try to set it up so that the priorities are set the way that community wants its priorities set. Whether it be vehicles first, cars first, even buses or trucks first. There are places that have done that and say, that's because we want a lot of trucks because it's an industrial area, okay? Okay, so you can lower the hands and ask this question. Wide roads are bad. Look how fast they go on the interstate. And I believe that wide roads are bad. Now, again, this is one if I ask that the public believes that you hear this all the time. And there are a lot of people, well, if we make the roads narrower, that's going to reduce the speeds and it's going to make things safer. Because remember, I showed you earlier, speed is very, very critical for pedestrians, especially. The problem with that is it's only true to a certain extent. Like everything, it's not a single item in the whole vacuum, okay? Wide roads are bad is not necessarily a completely true myth. Because if you think about the interstate, they go fast. On the other hand, if you look at the crashes per vehicle mile and the fatalities per vehicle mile, they're lower in the interstate than on any type of road. And yet they're wider and people are going faster. So it's not a direct surrogate. A narrow road that it feels like a road you should be going slow can actually be safer. On the other hand, if you try to overly narrow a roadway up where people have to go, you actually create safety problems. You make things less safe.
because now people don't have as much room to properly maneuver. You really need to set the width of the road to match the conditions as part of an overall plan. Now here's one I've heard quite often. Let's see how many be people believe this one. Can you lower their hand for me, please, Amanda. Thank you. Ignore maintenance. Leave the road filled with potholes and no shoulders and the cars will go slower. Okay, so some of you have heard this one. Yeah, we'll go slower. That's true. Not really. Turns out with the modern car, you might damage the car more. You might be more likely to break the springs. But by the time you get the road uh, rough enough to slow people down, it's actually probably rough enough to be a safety hazard. Okay, to really do that, you've got to, you're actually creating safety issues and liability issues for your community. You really need to fill those potholes in and people tend to drive at almost the same speed. If you actually look at speed studies before and after work has been done, not counting where they realign it and be careful about that. I'm just talking about making the road smooth but leaving the alignment the same. Yeah, it goes up maybe a little, but only by a few miles an hour, not by much. With modern cars, people tend to go about the speed again that they feel comfortable with. To get them going slow enough to really do this, you'd have to do a lot of big, big, big potholes and to be a safety issue. Now, a good question that's not quite related to this one, but the one before, people here from out of town, they speed past my home, but, everyone, but they want everyone to not speed past their own cottage. Well, and that's the challenge with all of these things. People want everybody else to slow down, but we gotta think about how do we get everybody to slow down, including themselves, okay? Let's go to our next one here, once my computer wakes up. Ah, uh, lights are enough, especially in urban cores or big urban areas. We'll just put up traffic lights and the pedestrians can cross with the light. How many of you believe that one or have heard that one? Okay, while they're uh, bringing that up, somebody says, uh, somebody says they can show you a road that's so bad you will slow down. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. There are roads that are rough enough where you'll slow down. But when someone has a crash on that, your liability is probably a little higher than you might want it to be. And have you really slowed it down to help the community or have you really slowed it down for other reasons? Now, in this particular one, traffic lights are enough. A lot of people think the pedestrians can walk to the light. It is amazing what pedestrians will do. If you haven't caught it, the yellow circle shows a pedestrian crossing away from the traffic light, which is about 80 feet away pedestrians will do what they do. And so we have to deal with that reality. It's not always perfect. And that's where we sometimes will put in mid block crossings, but they have their own safety issues. So be aware when you're setting up a program where pedestrians want to start and end the same origin destination kind of studies that we do for vehicles. We can even think about that for pedestrians. And if you put a barrier in their way and they think they can go over it, they will. And even if that barrier is a dangerous road, they'll try to cross it. So keep that in mind. Lights alone are probably not enough. We may need to do other things if there's a large pedestrian demand. So what we can do then is pedestrian signals at all of our lights. And uh, we just need to give pedestrians priority to improve safety. How many of you believe that one? Okay. Quite a few of you. This one, and this one is one of those ones that is on that boundary line. It's not a complete myth. Pedestrian signals do actually help quite a bit and giving pedestrians priority can do some very important improvements in safety. However, be very careful that you don't overemphasize pedestrians to the point where you either decrease capacity or you can actually, in some limited cases, there are times when we've given pedestrians so much priority on the wrong kind of road, collectors and arterials, that we've actually made things less safe. Pedestrian priority is very important, especially in traffic calming, but just be aware of the fact that it doesn't always do what we think it's going to do. Realize the positive and negative of every single solution that's out there. Okay, so you lower their hand for me, Amanda. We'll see how many people believe this one. Do not widen anything. Adding sidewalks and shoulders will make the road look wide and the cars will drive too fast. Okay. And don't have a lot of votes for this one. 
Okay. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't expect that. We know that widening, adding sidewalks and shoulders can help. But again, think about perception. Think about what people will see, what they believe. Belief is part of the, part of the equation. Okay. Road diets. Road diets narrow up the road and slow cars down. You believe that? In the right place, a road diet is one of our best tools. We don't use them enough in both traffic calming and complete streets. In fact, a road diet where you actually come in and take a four lane and you put in bike lanes and turning lanes and a center uh, lane can actually improve capacity and safety at the same time. So yeah, this is one of those ones that's not a myth. It's actually true, but a lot of people don't believe it, okay? So keep that in mind. There are some tools we don't use in our toolbox as much as we probably should, okay? Wide shoulders, oh, I must decide to skip forward here. Wide shoulders are needed to improve safety, okay? True or false? What do you think? Is that a myth? A lot of you say that it's true. And in certain places, it's absolutely true, especially with high speed. Those shoulders can make a huge difference. But just as important as the width of the shoulder is the consistency of the shoulder. Don't take a wide shoulder and suddenly make it narrow. That can really decrease safety. And if the shoulder looks like it's part of the road, people will drive that way. So when you put the shoulders in, make sure they look like shoulders and they're there for safety reasons, not just because you want an extra width on the roadway, okay? This one you see a lot. It cannot be plowed. The plower emergency vehicle can't get around this particular location. They won't be able to get through. The roundabouts are our most common when we see that question asked, but speed humps can be the same thing. You think that's true or not for speed humps and uh, roundabouts? Yeah, a few of you think so. Again, this is where the engineering comes in. If we don't design for the snow plow, we don't design for the fire truck, yes, it won't work. But if you design for them, if you're including them in the design process, you can actually get through them fairly well. But usually what happens is we too much cookie cutter or we don't think into account the different vehicles that are available. So one of the things you might wanna think about doing is get some folks with the highway department yourselves and some folks with the fire department, find a big parking lot and put some cones down and check what they really can do safely and properly. And then that turning template could be used to make sure you've got good radius where you've got it or your speed hump isn't gonna be a problem. You can make them traversable. We've got some really good examples of speed humps in this community, and we've got some that are good examples of what not to do. The whole idea is it can be done properly and it can be plowed. Obviously, you don't have to worry about that. Somebody asked, are you raising a hand if it's think it's true or think it's a myth? I probably need to be clearer on that. I'll, I'll make sure I'm clear on the next one here. So the idea is, do you believe that there are not enough bicyclists to worry about in your area? No bicycles here. Do you believe that's true? There aren't enough bicyclists. It's only a few of you, okay? And that's not surprising. There's again, just like pedestrians, there's probably a lot more bicyclists than we think that are out there. And so as you're developing your plans, make sure you think about them, especially in the world of complete streets, because remember in complete streets, we want all users to be part of the equation. But if you put in something that's not bicycle friendly and there's a lot of bicyclists, you could actually make things less safe, okay? So for instance, rumble strips. If you're putting in rumble strips along the side, you wanna think about, are there bicyclists? And if there's even a few, you wanna account for them and not necessarily have a continuous rumble strip or put in some gaps so they can get in and out off the shoulder, okay? But instead, here's the other one that people say, well, we don't need shoulders for bicyclists. We're just gonna have them use the bike path. Do you think that's true? That we could just put them all on a bike path? A Couple of you think so, okay. Turns out bike paths are a really nice tool, okay? I like bike paths, but type A bicyclist, the really good bicyclist, they just stay right on the road. They go the direction they like, they don't like super steep hills, though some of them purposely go up them because they want the exercise. But bicycle paths are part of an overall program. Again, not a spot improvement. So something to keep in mind is 
where the bicycle is actually going, okay? And breaking the grade of the pavement at the white line really sucks for the bikers. If it's too much of a turnover, yeah. So one of the things we want to do is not have too much of a break in the grade between the shoulder and the mainline road. That's a safety issue for cars as well as it is for bicycles, okay? So don't make that change too dramatic, but you need a little bit of a change because of the nature of the way drainage works. And like everything, it's a balancing act between the two, okay? Okay, a couple of quick ADA points. Um, this is ADA one. How many of you, raise your hand. When you see this picture, think of somebody in a wheelchair. Okay, a lot of you think of somebody in a wheelchair. Okay, this is a, uh, a symbol that's used here in New York for uh, people who have an ADA parking permit. It is technically not allowed on the signs. If there is an official symbol, I'll show that, you know, that's the one, the static one that you're used to seeing. I understand why the people who advocate want for this sign do so. But again, it's a symbol. What we're trying to do is tell people, hey, this is a handicapped issue. But handicapped could include lots of different things. It could include somebody who will walk her, like we saw in one of the earlier pictures. It could include somebody who has got a hearing or a visual impairment. It could even just be somebody who's colorblind and you want to make sure that the lights are properly aligned so they can tell which is red, which is yellow, and which is green by their alignment. Okay. Disabilities are not just people in a wheelchair. Okay. So we don't, we have to do more than just worry about wheelchairs. Now ADA2 on the other side of the coin, if you are worrying about wheelchairs, do me a favor and think about the wheelchairs. Okay. Uh, I don't think either of these two places are going to work too well for somebody. Okay, I'm not going to have you raise your hand on this one. Just keep it in mind. People in wheelchairs are part of the stream of people using your system. But all people who are disabled need to be accounted for if possible. But I'm certainly glad I'm not trying to get around this telephone pole or across the street in this particular location. Okay. Okay, here's one. Uh, how many people believe police informant enforcement will solve our problem. We're just gonna need more speed enforcement and that'll take care of our problem. Raise your hand if you think that's true. And while you're raising your hand, some people say I understand the appropriate language is people with disabilities. Yeah, that's, there's lots of different answers to that particular question and I'll never admit that I'm perfect at that. We always do our best, okay? Um, I heard a speaker at a conference once, he actually talked about that word, and he says, the biggest thing is attitude. How do we treat the people that have a particular issue? Um, and that's what I try to do the best I can. We're just human. Okay, so in terms of speed enforcement, some of you raised your hand. We know that you can't have, we don't have enough police to enforce everything. You just can't enforce your way out of a problem. Will select enforcement help? Yes. Can select enforcement solve an overall problem? Probably not. You just don't have enough people. These little speed cameras can help in limited places, but after people go by them a while, they either just ignore them if there's not somebody enforcing it, or even if they are, they sort of say, eh, I'll take my chances. In fact, during this recent crisis, when people are at home, they've noticed speeding is going up because they feel the enforcement's not there. So it can help some, but it's not gonna help as much as people think it might. And then of course, no solutions are po possible. The public will complain too much, okay? You believe that's true? That there's no solutions to help out other than cars? Well, of course not. We know that this is a myth. There are solutions out there, but sometimes we have to get out of the comfort zone that we're not used to, okay? There are solutions, but you have to realize there's a balancing act with all of these solutions that exist. And remember that process. The process starts with figuring out and defining the problem, but it also comes back to the idea of building a consensus, getting people involved, okay? That really makes a big difference. Yeah, somebody mentioned speeds are up because the roads are less crowded. Yeah, that's part of it, but there's also been some people who are speeding because they can and, uh, 
some really high speeds, like 100 in a 30 mile an hour zone in the Chicago area, okay? But remember, this is a process. Traffic calming, complete streets, actually all of engineering is a process. So keep that in mind as you're moving forward. I like road safety audits. They're one of my favorite tools in the toolkit. We could use them even more. And the idea then is to go out with the people who are going to be affected. That includes the people who live there, businesses, schools, obviously the enforcement people from the police, the highway agencies. Walk and look at the problems and try to come up with a solution together. You'd be amazed how often you can find a solution that everybody goes, yeah, it's not perfect, but it is a good solution with the economics that we can afford, okay? So I'm a big fan of them. Try road safety audits or assessments, whatever tools you like. And keep in mind at the end of the day, what's important is the people that we all serve, okay? And then once my mouse decides to move forward, So define complete streets and traffic calming. Hmm. So we could define complete streets and traffic calming. I told you I would give you a definition. Before I do that, I want to remind you of a couple of things. Okay. Community involvement is the most important element. Okay. You've got to get community involvement. And why do I need community involvement? Well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to ask you a question and see what you think. Uh, get the right poll here. Okay. What is the most important factor in the success of traffic calming and complete streets? Okay. Yeah. Looks like most of you are getting it. That's good. Okay. The most important factor in the success of traffic calming and complete streets is, as you're going to see, you got it right, it's communications. We have to communicate what we're trying to do. We need that engineering. We need some enforcement. We have to at least think about the political considerations. And of course, money is always part of the equation. But the reality is communications is by far the most important thing which means getting involvement from the community and the stakeholders that are involved, okay? So communication is the number one element that will make your systems succeed or not succeed. Now, in terms of involvement, who you might bring in, obviously the people who live on a road, businesses that are affected, but travelers who cut through are part of the equation. You need to think about them. You need to think about the police, the schools, all the different agencies that are involved. And there's a whole bunch, okay? So you could make this list. We could spend 10 minutes making this list, okay? You might wanna even include the transit company, the bus company, utilities. There's all kind of people that might be involved, okay? Now, at the end of the day, when do you use it? Well, you've gotta have community support. When the conditions warrant for traffic, and there are tools available to determine that, and a lot of times we look at this when traditional methods do not work, though I'll admit some of the tools that we think are traditional are being superseded by some of the tools that we think of as out of the box. Roundabouts really actually are being used in some cases over the traditional traffic light. So at the end of the day, you just need to think about implementation. Make sure you provide an opportunity for input from everybody, from all interested parties, okay? and you'll probably be successful because that's what at the end of the day I want people to be as successful. Use area-wide plans, not spot solutions, and if possible, try temporary solutions. I'm a big fan of the temporary solutions. Try it, watch it, see how it's holding up, okay? Now, got one last poll question and then we'll get you out of here. For those who were wondering, by the way, um, we are going to be recording this, okay? And actually, no, I already did the poll, the most important factors. So we don't have to, any more polls, okay? And so I'm gonna give you my definition of traffic calming complete streets and then answer a couple of questions that people have put into the chat pot or the question pot. To find complete streets and traffic calming, here's what I say. I like to call it techniques to allow all users to share the road as safely and efficiently as possible, okay? Gotta keep that in mind, okay? 
So now I've got time for a couple of questions here that have been put in once the uh, mouse moves forward. We do have a couple of other workshops that are coming up uh, that are available. Uh, we'll be doing our bumper banter next Monday on Facebook Live two webinars, one on the Little Green Book and one on the cost of highway projects, and then uh, a town hall on uh, Wednesday uh, dealing with essential work uh, during the COVID uh, output that we're dealing with right now. So let me answer the quick questions that came up. Uh, again, is the webinar being recorded? Yes, it will be recorded. It'll be on our website. So you go to the website that's on the screen and there'll be something called the Information Highway right at the top. Click on that and it'll take you, you can actually get a recording of all the webinars that we're doing during this work from home period that we're in right now. And then somebody says here, I think it's time to put the four E's to rest. Uh, this framework has been around for a century, but in practice, education enforcement elements are always always small temporary effects. And uh, education and enforcement are hardly ever implemented at a scale sufficient to reduce crashes measurably, okay? And then finally, too frequently education and enforcement are token efforts that distract to find sustainable solutions. And then there's a link here to some stuff from the CDC on industrial engineering. I would tell you, I, I would agree with some of the points there, but my concern would be education and enforcement. Enforcement, we probably rely on too much, but education has done an amazingly good job, much more than we think, but it's really hard to measure education. That's one of the challenges we have. But most of us would not want people to go to school, which is why we're training our kids at home right now, okay? Crash rates in the United States have gone down consistently until the last four or five years. And we think most of the increase has to do with other factors. So it's part of the equation. And we will be sending out uh, information about future webinars for those who have, because we do believe in education, okay? And then finally, the last question, I'll answer this and we'll let you go for the day. Why is the term roads applied so often when you're showing city streets, not country roads? Well, I could call it a road, I could call it a street. Um, I could call it lots of different things. Um, sometimes they get intermingled with each other. You can actually use complete streets and traffic calming almost anywhere. I could use the term highway, but uh, outside of New York State, a lot of people think of a highway as being an interstate or a major freeway. So it's just a matter of what the pictures show in a particular location. And I'm gonna to have to admit, I'll answer the last questions offline. We'll get your name and email you to you, but it is three o'clock. We'll let folks go. Um, and thank you very much. We'll be putting out, if you go to our website, you can see future information. And if you need to know about the updating webinars, just go to our website and we can also email them to you as well. With that, I wanna thank you very much and have yourself a great day.